the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Good evening. Welcome to the World Over Live. Forgive my cold. You know what they say, if you can't share a cold with your kids, you're probably not close enough to them. Uh, we've got a great show for you tonight. Washington Times columnist and radio personality Jeff Cooner is here. We'll talk about the continuing battle between church and state, presidential politics, and some stories from the culture. And later, the mass is about to change significantly for English-speaking Catholics. What can you expect, and how will it affect the way you worship? Father Mark Nestout, director of the Archdiocese of Washington's Office for Worship, joins us, and he'll take your questions. Get those calls and emails in now. You can reach us at one 800 221 9460 in the U.S. and internationally, 205-271-2980, or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. Well, let's get started. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. In Nigeria this past weekend, more than 150 people were killed in a series of attacks launched by a radical Islamist sect. Gunmen opened fire at a Catholic church as mostly women and children were holding a prayer vigil. Two women were killed. Eleven others were hospitalized with gunshot wounds. Military buildings, police stations, businesses, and other churches were uh, among the targets bombed or attacked by gunmen. The jihadist sect Boko Haram claimed responsibility. According to the Associated Press, Boko Haram has killed at least 361 people this year alone. During a Sunday audience in Rome, Pope Benedict urged an end to the violence in Nigeria, which he said is spreading hate and division even amongst those who have faith. And a much hoped for papal visit to Ireland in 2012 appears to be unlikely. This according to the head of the International Eucharistic Congress, which was scheduled to take place in Dublin next June. Ireland's foreign minister recently told members of parliament that an invitation had been extended to the pope, or rather had not been extended to the pope, nor is one currently under active consideration. Relations between Dublin and the Vatican have deteriorated since June, when Ireland's government officially denounced the Vatican for its alleged role in Ireland's clerical abuse scandal. The Vatican has since recalled uh, its ambassador from Ireland, and just this past week, Ireland announced it shuttering its embassy to the Holy See. Government leaders have insisted that the embassy closure had nothing to do with the recent diplomatic strife, that it was merely a budgetary decision. And in a related note, the Vatican announced Thursday that Pope Benedict will be making 2012 visits to Mexico and Cuba. The visits will mark Pope Benedict's first to Spanish-speaking countries in Latin America. He visited Brazil in 2007 and will return there for World Youth Day in 2013. And the Vatican Secretary of State has in instituted a new policy in the wake of a financial document released by the Vatican office, or by a, a Vatican office, last month. You'll remember the Vatican Council for Justice and Peace issued that controversial call for a global bank with taxing authority. It made global headlines. In reaction to that document, all new Roman Curia documents and statements must now be cleared by the Vatican's top cardinal, Secretary of State Tarsicio Bertone. Vatican journalist Sandro Magister reported that the new protocol was created by Bertone, who claims he did not know of the 20-page global finance proposal until moments before its release. The document was harshly criticized by the Vatican's own paper, Lisbertore Romano, and disowned by Cardinal Bertone himself. And the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops has filed a Freedom of Information Act request against the Department of Health and Human Services. This after the Bishop's Program for Aiding Victims of Human Trafficking was denied a renewal of a $2.5 million federal grant. 
Apparently at issue is the Bishop's Migration and Refugee Services policy of not providing support for contraceptive and abortive services or abortion services. According to the Washington Post, senior political appointees at HHS declined to renew the grant, overruling its own staff and an independent review board. Sister Marianne Walsh, the Bishop's Director of Media Relations, questioned the grant decision-making, stating that, in her opinion, it was a sad manipulation of a process to promote a pro-abortion agenda. More about this in our next segment. And on Tuesday, Mississippi voters rejected the so-called personhood amendment by a 58 to 42 percent margin. The ballot initiative would have amended the state constitution and defined a person to include, quote, every human being from the moment of fertilization, cloning, or the functional equivalent thereof, end quote. The state's bishops had remained neutral on the measure, citing that its passage could ultimately harm efforts to overturn Roe v. Wade. The National Right to Life Committee came out against the proposal, citing concerns over legal challenges. A similar personhood amendment failed twice in Colorado. Proponents of the measure have vowed to try again. And in a recent decree, Archbishop Timothy Dolan of New York said that clergy and employees of his archdiocese may not participate in a civil same-sex marriage ceremony, nor may church property or facilities be used for such events. Archbishop Dolan noted that these actions were needed to, quote, reaffirm the authentic teaching on marriage and to preserve and foster the supremely sacred value of the married state. The state of New York redefined marriage to include same-sex partnerships. The law took effect in July. And a Vatican journalist is reporting that Pope Benedict's recent decision to use a rolling platform for Vatican liturgical ceremonies is due to arthrosis, a degenerative joint condition in the legs, and not merely to prevent fatigue, as previously announced by the Vatican. Andrea Tor Tornielnelli of uh, La Stampa said the condition makes it uh, painful for Pope Benedict to walk long distances. Thus, the pontiff suggested the use of the rolling platform. Pope Benedict, who is now 84, has slowed in his stride in recent months. He's occasionally used a cane in public and reportedly uses it more regularly around the Apostolic Palace. And finally, Bill Keane, creator of the Family Circus comic strip, died this week at the age of 89. For more than half a century, Family Circus entertained readers with a simple mix of humor and the traditional American values. Keene, a Roman Catholic, literally drew from the lighter and heartwarming moments of his own family's life. But the family circus will go on. Bill's son, Jeff, took over the cartoon after his dad's retirement a few years ago. So that's good news. And many of you uh, in our viewing audience has been, have been writing and emailing about whether the world over will continue broadcasting from the John Paul II Cultural Center. Many of you are still asking if you can come see the show. Unfortunately, as of the middle of December, that won't be the case. The Knights of Columbus recently acquired this building and have asked us to leave by the end of the year. So we're searching out another broadcast home here in D.C. And as we continue to do so, we hope you'll keep us in your prayers. We'll keep you posted. Up next, Jeffrey Cooner of The Washington Times is here. We'll talk about the news of the week, the role of faith in the coming election, and that controversial Glee episode. And we'll take your calls when the world of our live continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. My first guest is a columnist for The Washington Times, as well as a national radio personality, here to discuss the latest in presidential politics, some news of the day, as well as some cultural issues. Would you welcome Jeffrey Cooner? Jeffrey, thank you. Great for to be here, Raymond. My pleasure. pleasure. I'm so glad to have you. My pleasure. Uh, let's start with this HHS grant. We mentioned it in the headlines a little bit. Uh, this is a grant that Health and Human Services has made to the Bishop's uh, Refugee Committee. What they do, basically, MRS, uh, they reassign, help these, these victims of human trafficking uh, to find 
treatment, homes, work, get, work them through the process so they have a, a leg to stand on. 44 states they've done this in, and they've been denied this grant. Your take on this? Some are saying this is payback, Kathleen Sebelius and the Obama administration making the bishops pay. How do you see this? Well, my take on it, Raymond, is it is payback. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're seeing now, and I'm choosing my words very carefully, mm -hmm. is the most anti-Christian, radical, anti-Catholic administration in living memory. Mm -hmm. They are angry at the Catholic Conference of Bishops for criticizing federal funding of abortion in Obamacare. Mm -hmm. They are clamping down on Catholic charities, Catholic hospitals, Catholic organizations that are out trying to treat people, but they're ordering them to provide abortion services, mm -hmm. to provide contraception. They are violating the conscience rights of Catholics. Yeah. They have instigated gays in the military. What you're seeing is an all-out secular assault upon our mm -hmm. Judeo-Christian values. Yeah. So they know the Catholic vote is key in 2012. So they why alienate it, though? I mean, you've got, a, you've got a Washington Post piece saying, some HHF staffers objected to the involvement of the secretary's office because one of her assistants, Kathleen Sebelius's assistant, Sharon Parrott, apparently intervened in this process. Uh, it goes on. Uh, the, this secretary's office apparently said uh, that the goal was to exclude the Catholic bishops. That's a quote from the Washington Post piece. Why would they create firestorms on the eve of a major presidential election? This is part of a larger pattern with this administration. Mm -hmm. They demonize Wall Street. They demonize corporate jet owners. They demonize the wealthy. They demonize Republicans. They demonize any critics of the administration. So if you oppose Obamacare, or at least the federal mm -hmm. funding aspect of Obamacare, if you oppose them on a wide range of social cultural issues, mm -hmm. this is the Chicago way. You reward your friends and you punish your enemies. Mm -hmm. But, the, but the, the bishops were supportive, in theory at least, and in, in, uh, in concept of a nationalized health care, some sort of national approach to health care. Why remove what could be an ally? in so many of these battles. Because the problem, Raymond, is this, and the Obama administration knows it. They're hearing from the Vatican. They're hearing from traditional Catholics. Whether you're for or against nationalized health care, that's not the issue. Mm -hmm. The key thing about Obamacare is that it does something that no other piece of legislation has ever done. It enshrines the federal funding of abortion. Mm -hmm. In other words, it compels you, me, devout Catholics, mm -hmm. to give our tax dollars in support and to subsidize a process that is not only heinous, but frankly goes against the fundamental teachings of the Catholic Church. Mm. It's a violation of our religious freedoms. It's a violation of our conscience rights. Mm -hmm. So they know that many devout Catholics on this issue of federal funding for abortion mm. are going to go and vote against Obama. And rather than say, you know what, maybe we should re-examine this. We had a truce after Roe v. Wade. The truce was this. Yes, abortion would be legalized, but you don't fund, you use taxpayer dollars to fund abortions. Mm -hmm. Now they've crossed that line. So what they're now doing is they're sending a signal to the bishops. They're sending a signal to the Catholic Church. You don't want to play ball with this on us? Forget that grant. You're not going to get any more money. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get any more support. And Raymond, this is what I find, frankly, particularly reprehensible. Mm -hmm. Say what you want about illegal immigration and the issue of securing our border. The Catholic Church has been on the front lines. They're in a lot of these Hispanic communities. Mm -hmm. They're in a lot of these Spanish Catholic communities. They're providing aid. They're providing assistance. Yeah. If you care about human trafficking, if you care about the way children are being pimped out, if mm -hmm. you care about uh, prostitution being brought in, the exploitation of women, mm -hmm. it is the Catholic Church that's providing those services. Mm -hmm. So now they're going to withdraw a grant that's going to help mm -hmm. uh, uh, deal with the, with the problem of human trafficking, yeah. it's unconscionable right now. Yeah. Uh, Sister Mary Ann Walsh said uh, in, a, in a piece that uh, this is an attempt to promote abortion politics over real care for trafficking victims. Pretty strong words coming directly from the bishops. Well, and there you go. There is the culture of death mm -hmm. that this administration has been relentlessly championing. In other words, what they're more frightened of is that some nun or some priest that's mm -hmm. taking care of some poor woman who's been brought in at 16, 17 years of age by some human traffickers or by the drug cartels mm -hmm. as prostitutes, if they can escape and a Catholic charity or a Catholic church takes care of them, they're going to say to them, you know, if you happen to get pregnant, you should have that child. So mm -hmm. they're putting abortion politics 
ahead of the interests of these mm. poor illegals that are being yeah. trafficked into this country. It's, 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 yeah. it's reprehensible. I want to shift a little bit to this being the eve of Veterans Day. Um, we have a, a veteran here with us tonight. Um, there's this World War II memorial, a beautiful memorial in the middle of the mall, and God knows this generation deserves it. There's been a recent suggestion that in the middle of that <clears throat> memorial, just a plaque be erected with the words of FDR's prayer, which he composed and issued on the eve of the D-Day invasion. And it reads in part, Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. And it goes on. It's a long prayer. This has been blocked by the Bureau of Land Management and the Obama administration. Why would they oppose something as innocuous as a prayer on the side of a major memorial that no doubt many of the veterans watching tonight and some of those who were in the D-Day invasion, the few who are left with us, would probably love to see this. It's part of the radical secularization of our culture. It mentions God. Mm -hmm. To them, this is a violation of the separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. And my question is a simple one. The liberal icon of the 20th century was Franklin Roosevelt. If that prayer was good enough for maybe the most liberal president of the 20th century, Franklin Roosevelt, mm -hmm. it's not good enough for Obama? It's not mm -hmm. good enough for our veterans? Mm -hmm. And Raymond, this I think comes to the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. I know we'll talk about presidential politics yeah, coming we're up. Yeah, we'll get into that in a little bit. But if you're looking at the election of 2012, to me it is the most important contest in our lifetime. Why? Because right now, the decision that we have to make as Americans is, are we going to continue to drift into a European-style, secular, socialist superstate, Or are we going to return to the traditional America based on individual liberty, limited government, and our Judeo-Christian civilization? What you have seen from the 1960s on, and I believe this is the 2012 election, mm -hmm. it is the last fight of the 1960s. Obama is a child of the 60s. What did the 60s essentially want to achieve? The new left, the mm -hmm. radical left. Destroy God, implement sex, secularism, and socialism. Mm -hmm. So any mention of prayer in schools, any mention of the Ten Commandments, let's say, at a, at a, at a court, mm -hmm. any mention of God, God forbid you should teach abstinence to our children in schools, this is an abomination. Mm -hmm. And they have purged religion from the public square, even to the point now that to say a prayer mentioning God in honor of our veterans is now considered beyond the yeah. pale. Yeah. You read this story, no doubt, and, and some of you may have seen it in the Washington Post, where our war dead in the United States have been disposed of in landfills. And this has gone on for a number of years. Uh, limbs cut off of our, our dead veterans uh, to, to fit them into these caskets. I mean, barbaric things. How can this go on? And what do you think is the message people will take from this? And this administration, as well as congressional leaders, it's a lot of people that, that should be questioned about this. Story, I think. <clears throat> that we don't care about our veterans, mm -hmm. that they were used as fodder and as pawns to serve our war efforts, yet when they die and they come back home, they are not even given the dignity and decency of a proper burial. Mm -hmm. And I think, Raymond, it goes to a deeper issue, and it's what Pope Benedict has touched on and what the late, great JP2 touched on. Mm -hmm. It is the culture of death. We have no respect for human life anymore, okay. from conception until death. Yeah. We murder children in their wombs. We preach pornography. You have the breakdown of the family. Mm -hmm. Contraception is rampant. We are promoting sexuality, bestiality, homosexuality, bisexuality to our children. We kill our, our, our elderly through euthanasia and doctor-assisted suicide. Mm -hmm. And now, if you're a veteran, and for God forbid you die in Afghanistan or Iraq mm -hmm. to fight for the freedoms that you and I and the listeners take, take for granted. Yeah. If you get maimed, if you get blown up, you will not even have a proper burial. They'll dump you someplace. And you know what? Mm -hmm. Whether they remember you or not, nobody cares. If mm -hmm. I'm a veteran, I have to be asking certain questions. Yeah. Why are we not being given a proper burial? Why is the administration and Congress turning a blind eye? And more importantly, where's the American people? No, it's a scandal. It's a, it's scandal, a scandal of the highest and, order. And on Veterans Day, it, it should be addressed. It's time to address it. Let's look at these elections, what's happening out there. Uh, there was a new poll. 67%, that's two-thirds of this electorate, say they are very, they consider it very or somewhat important that the presidential candidate have strong religious beliefs. 67%. 
What impact do you think that poll will have on the people you see before you, both in the Republican and the Democratic? I think this is the silent majority. We have been seeing a re-evangelization in America over the last 10, 15 mm -hmm. years. You are seeing it on the life issue. You're seeing it on abortion issues. You're seeing it on the gay marriage issue in vote after vote. What's going to happen is this. The Republican Party is going to have to nominate a candidate that is strong on abortion, is strong on homosexual marriage, and is strong on the culture of life. Whether you look at Romney, Herman Cain, Rick Perry, Newt Gingrich, any of the top-tier candidates, they will have to be very solid on the social front. If not, they mm -hmm. will not win the nomination, and they certainly will not win the election. What about the second part of this poll? Um, it said 53% are comfortable with Mormonism. 42% are somewhat or very uncomfortable. Will that have an effect on a Romney candidacy? He's at the top of the polls <clears throat> right now. He's at the top of the polls, but Kane. I have to say, uh, Raymond, I've been talking to people in the Romney camp. Mm -hmm. They're nervous, and here's why. Mm -hmm. He's been running for the presidency now essentially for five, six years. Right. He lost in 2008. After he lost, he hasn't stopped campaigning. He cannot peak over 25%. He's capped at 25%. Mm -hmm. No matter how much he tries to sell himself, no matter how well he performs in the debates, 75% of the Republican primary electorate is not sold on Romney. I think one of the many reasons, part of it is he's a flip-flopper, mm -hmm. part of it they think he's a liberal, part of it think they just don't trust him, he has mm -hmm. no core convictions, but to many evangelicals, especially in the South, I think his Mormonism is an issue, and I think he has to address it, and if he doesn't address it, I don't see how he can win the South. Hmm. And if he doesn't win the South, I don't see how he wins the nomination. Yeah. What about Cain? These accusers have come out. Uh, he had a very <clears> strong <throat> press conference, really in command, didn't look down at the notes once. It was unbelievable. Um, your thought on whether Cain can escape this cloud of these accusations, or will we keep seeing others come forward, and will that damn his candidacy? Raymond, in all the years I've been in Washington, I have never seen a story quite like this. Here you have anonymous sources based on flimsy evidence, really a whispering campaign, mm -hmm. being used to destroy this man. Why? The same liberal press corps, the same liberal media, when it came to Bill Clinton, they gave him a pass on Jennifer Flowers, mm -hmm. on Monica Lewinsky, mm -hmm. on Paula Jones, on Juanita Broderick, mm -hmm. on Kathleen Willey. And remember, what Clinton was accused was a lot more than propositioning a woman to a hotel suite. Yeah. He was accused of exposing himself mm -hmm. uh, and asking to be serviced by Paula yeah. Jones in exchange for a job. Mm -hmm. Kathleen Willey said she was assaulted in the White House. Juanita Broderick even said in the Wall Street Journal that she had been raped mm -hmm. by then Attorney General Clinton. Mm -hmm. To the left, it's just sex. Hey, it's private, it's not mm -hmm. public, mm -hmm. it's only his character, character doesn't matter. Now when it comes to an African-American conservative mm -hmm. who poses a mortal threat to the Democratic Electoral Coalition mm -hmm. to go after the black vote, the African-American vote, which has been the linchpin of the Democratic Party for the last 40 years, suddenly now, uh, if he made an inappropriate gesture or he propositioned a woman or he groped her in a car, suddenly, no, he's not fit to be president. Well, I think there's a blatant double standard here. Mm -hmm. There's blatant hypocrisy here. And the American well, uh, people uh, feel it's unfair, and I think that's why, so far, mm -hmm. Herman Cain has been able to weather the storm. Mm -hmm. And none of these charges have really stuck. I mean, the, as you said, the evidence hasn't really come forward. There are accusations without merit in most cases. Well, Even the woman who came forward this week... Um, Lots of holes in this story. Well, she's got bankruptcy issues. She's got... Uh, uh, a also, serial litigator. Serial litigator. Mm -hmm. Apparently, her best friend even said, quote, she's a gold digger. This was in the New York Post. Mm -hmm. So she's got serious character issues. But, but, but with this cloud hanging over Kane, and, and one imagines it's going to, this drumbeat's going to continue. There's a threat of more press conferences from other accusers, or they're all going to come together and sort of make a joint statement. Does Newt Gingrich become the alternative to Romney, and does he profit by Kane's diminution, if that's indeed what happens. You, you literally, you just anticipated my next column next week, Raymond. This mm -hmm. is what I think is going to happen. Kane's campaign, I think, is going to peter out. Not because of these allegations. Mm -hmm. Although if there's a fifth, sixth, seventh woman, I think it'll sink him. Yeah. When I'm watching the debate yesterday, you ask Herman Kane about Italy and the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. What's his answer? The 999. 999 yeah. You ask him about the stock market, 999. You ask him about the deficit, 999. You ask him how to balance the budget, 999. Well, he's clear. You see, he's got that brand and he's, he's a one trick pony. And I think yeah. he doesn't have the depth 
Mm. He doesn't have the experience. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have the, the repertoire and the knowledge that I believe you need to be commander in chief. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why he's gonna peter out. Then the alternative, who can Republicans and conservatives go for? Mm -hmm. Bachman is now wounded. Mm -hmm. Perry fatally shot himself last night. I think the only one left is Newt Gingrich. Mm. He is somebody now who is, I think, won every debate. He is articulate. He's knowledgeable. He's excellent on life issues. He's very good on economic issues. He's solid on foreign policy. He's a formidable debater. He's mm. resonating and connecting with people in these halls. I look at these, I look at these debates. Raymond, he's the only candidate. When he speaks, mm. you can hear a pin drop. Everybody's face is focusing mm. in on, on Newt Gingrich. The more time goes on, if he can raise money and he finishes second or third in Iowa, he will have to make his stand in South Carolina. And I believe he can win South Carolina. Yeah. If he wins South Carolina, he can win much of the South and take the nomination from Rob. Fascinating. Let's go to the phones. David, what's your question? Go ahead, David. Yes, uh, I would just like to ask your uh, guest this evening in regard to uh, talking about uh, federal monies and abortion. Mm -hmm. As earlier in the year when uh, Sister Carol was explaining about uh, federal health care and uh, mm -hmm. the protection from right. abortion. Was she being duped herself or was she trying to dupe the rest of the people? Hmm. Sister Carol Key, in the head of the Catholic uh, 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 Hospital, she's a lobbyist group, the Catholic Hospital Health Association. Um, she was also a major uh, supporter of the health care plan, was there at the signing. Was she duped? I think she was. And <clears throat> what the duping was, it, it all went back to when you had Bart Stupak. And there he was, a Democrat mm -hmm. then, he's no longer in Congress, but a pro, supposedly an alleged pro-life Democrat mm -hmm. who came out and said, I stand with pro-life Democrats. Mm -hmm. And here I have an executive order, a piece of paper, a letter from mm -hmm. President mm -hmm. Obama that says federal funding dollars will not be used to subsidize abortions. Mm -hmm. Well, an executive uh, uh, order is meaningless. It's nothing. Yeah. It's an empty piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Stupak, I think, betrayed his principles, betrayed his constituency, mm -hmm. sold out in order to ingratiate himself with the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. And so I believe he was betrayed. I believe the Catholic Church was betrayed. I believe the Catholic hierarchy was betrayed. And I think, look, the, the, the proof of the eating is in the pudding. This bill, if you look at it, subsidizes abortions. We know that. Now we're seeing a retaliation by the, by the administration against the church on a wide range of positions. Are we watching and presiding over the end of Catholic health care because of the federal mandates and requirements that will be put in place and are already being put, put in yes, place? Yes, and I think it's a deliberate strategy. I think they don't want Catholic health care. I think they want religious organizations, whether it be Catholics but or Jeff, other Christian denominations. But this is a third of the, of the hospital and medical base of our country. One third of the health care is provided by Catholic health, health associations and hospitals. How can we do without them? This is part of the social service net and, and the net for the safety net for the poor. And they've done a magnificent job, and they've done it historically, they've done it efficiently, they've done it with great compassion. And now that all falls to the federal government. Now the government is going to sweep over and essentially monopolize the health care sector. And that's been, that's at the heart of the Obamacare mm. uh, uh, bill, that's at the heart of Obama's agenda, and I think that's why it's going to be deemed unconstitutional mm -hmm. in the summer, and I believe it will be repealed. Mm -hmm. I want to talk quickly about this show, Glee. It's one of the most watched shows on television, particularly for young kids, teens, some parents even watch. It. I get some email. Uh, there was a show this past week where four of the lead characters, two couples, a gay couple and a straight couple, lose their virginity. They talk at length about contraceptive use, uh, how, how they feel love for each other, and it builds up to the end where they lose their virginity. Your thoughts on what is being promulgated via Glee and shows like it? And then I want to move to the impact of what this is doing in the, in the cultural landscape, what it's allowing children to be portrayed as and young people. But tell me first about this episode. I don't know how much you read about it or so. I mean, I've read about it. Mm -hmm. I don't watch a lot of TV precisely because mm -hmm. of this. I think it's a symptom of our declining and coarsening culture. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, to me, much of television is unwatchable now. Yeah. They are promoting actively the gay lifestyle. They are promoting permissive sex. They're promoting recreational sex, casual mm -hmm. sex. Look at what we're teaching our young children. Forget on television, in schools. Uh, I have a niece. They're already beginning to teach her, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. They're teaching her about condom use. 
They're teaching her about contraception. Mm -hmm. They're teaching her about... Uh, in Heather, public schools. In public schools. Yep. Heather has two mommies. Uh, Timmy mm -hmm. has two daddies. Mm -hmm. They are promoting a sexual, gay, uh, anti-Catholic, anti-life agenda in mm -hmm. our schools. They're doing it flagrantly. I think they're, part, they're trying to indoctrinate our children. Mm -hmm. And so what the popular culture is just manifesting what is happening in many of our schools. Mm -hmm. And Raymond, I think if Christians don't stand up and say, if we can't protect the innocence of our children, mm -hmm. I mean, we're not talking about 18-year-old consenting adults. We're talking about 11, 12, 13-year-old kids. Yeah. They have no business being taught homosexuality or bisexuality or lesbianity or being told that, quote, being responsible is wearing a condom. No, being responsible is practicing abstinence. Yeah, well, the other, the other part of this is uh, the, when, you, when you have underage individuals, children, engaging in sex, it's illegal activity in all 50 states. This is illegal. So d d the promulgation of that is a, is a huge problem. The second component is it sets up children and young people as sexual actors and objects. This is a huge problem. So on one hand, we're celebrating this sexual awakening of the young. On the other hand, we're covering this horrific Penn State story and uh, stories of child sexual abuse all over the place. Where is that coming from? It's coming from a culture that's making space and permitting and allowing these predators to look in and say, oh, well, this is an acceptable uh, love interest. This is an acceptable target of my affection physically. Something is deeply wrong in a culture that's promoting this sort of thing. Uh, I think it's something very sick. And yeah. I think this is the consequence of the culture of death. Mm -hmm. And when you have a culture that glamorizes sex, and it's not just what we're seeing with teenagers. You look at Vogue magazine in France, they're putting five, six, seven-year-olds in silk stockings, in high mm -hmm. heels. We are sexualizing our children. To me, it's no accident that you have a Penn State. You have a coach who, apparently by a graduate student, was seen uh, having sex with a 10-year-old in the shower. Yeah. He then reports it to Joe Paterno, the legendary coach, right. Does Paterno call the police? Does Paterno confront the defensive coach, the yeah. defensive coordinator? Yeah. No, he kicks it upstairs to some bureaucrat and some administrator. Yeah, some vice president and who's now, now under indictment. Who's now under indictment. And now we're finding out that perhaps Sandusky, this coach, was maybe running some kind of a prostitution ring, that he was pimping out these children, mm. uh, dozens of children, to high rich donors of mm. the university. Oh and this was being done under the nose of the university because he was generating a lot of money. Horrendous. And what does it say about Penn State? When after they got rid of him, and it looks like they forced him to retire right. in exchange for the cover up, where they said to him, you know, you can keep your foundation, you can keep hanging around these kids, but you know, just don't bring it on our campus. Meaning, if you want to abuse these children, go ahead, but just don't do it on our turf. Yeah, wow. What does this say, the callous disregard that we have for our own children? Yeah. Well, if you keep sexualizing children, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. We are unleashing the floodgates. Literally, Raymond, I don't want to be overdramatic, yeah. but we are returning to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's scary. Let's go to the phones. Uh, go ahead. You're calling from Lafayette? Or you're Lafayette yeah. calling from Colorado? <laughs> you there? Hello, I'm here. Okay. Go ahead. What's Actually, your question? I turned on the TV. Hi, I wanted to uh, ask the reporter, uh, why, why didn't he uh, bring up Rick Santorum? Okay. Jeff, why, why well, not mention Rick Santorum, a Catholic? Uh, he's a Catholic. Uh, I think he's excellent on family issues. He's excellent on the life issues. I think he's excellent on... Uh, tax issues, uh, economic issues. But Rick isn't breaking 5% in most he's, of these he's polls. He's in 2 or 3% in most of the polls. Mm -hmm. The problem with Rick Santorum, I think, is this, and there's no getting around it. He lost for his re-election in the Senate in 2006. And the question mm -hmm. that many voters have, and I think it's a legitimate question, if you mm -hmm. can't hold your own Senate seat, what business do you have punching above your weight level to win the presidency? Mm -hmm. He's not seen as viable. He's seen as too narrow. He's seen as too much as a one-issue candidate. Mm -hmm. And so... I don't think, to me, he's not a plausible candidate. What voters are looking for is someone with serious executive experience, a governor, either like Romney or Perry, or they're looking at somebody like Gingrich, who was the Speaker of the House, uh, passed several balanced budgets, mm -hmm. gave us welfare reform. In other words, a man of serious accomplishments. That's why, Raymond, I think in the end it's going to come down to three candidates. Uh, Perry last night, I thought, committed political Harry Carey. If you can't tell me what three agencies you want to abolish, yeah. you have no business being in the White House. Yeah. But it's going to be between Herman Cain 
and I think really Newt Gingrich and Mitt Romney. My money right now would be on Romney. He has the Republican establishment behind him. Yep. He has a lot of money behind him. Uh, he's got, frankly, a very good campaign staff. He's got a lot of name recognition. Mm -hmm. The problem with Romney is he is not loved by the conservative base. And if there's one person that can emerge from the pack and become the standard bearer for conservative Tea Party Republicans, and mm -hmm. it could be Newt, then Romney will have a serious fight on his hands. Okay, very good. Jeff Cooner, thanks so much my for pleasure, your Raymond. Uh, analysis of all of this. And my goodness, it was wide ranging. You can follow Jeffrey Cooner and read his columns by visiting the Washington Times website at WashingtonTimes.com. Click on Opinion at the top of the page, and then click on Cooner. Up next, when we return, many of you are about to notice a few changes at Mass starting this Advent. The third edition of the Roman Missal is about to take effect. Father Mark Nestout from the Archdiocese of Washington is here to explain the changes and the intention behind them. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. My next guest is the director of the Office of Worship for the Archdiocese of Washington. For the better part of the year, he's conducted over 20 workshops on the upcoming changes in the Mass. And we're all about to experience them when the third edition of the Roman Missal is introduced on November 27th, the first Sunday of Advent. Here to enlighten us on what the Mass will look and sound like, in a few short weeks is Father Mark Nestout. Father Mark, thanks for being here. Nice to be here. Now, many of our viewers, uh, half of them, uh, I've, I've been getting emails and Facebook messages from them all day in the UK, in New Zealand. They've already implemented this. So if you'd like to call in, give us a call. Tell us how it's going. I'd like to hear from you too. On our shores, we're still hearing some people saber rattling around the edges, saying that this is uh, awkward, it's archaic, and it's inaccessible. It's too formal. What would you say to that? I wouldn't say that it's 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 formal. It's a way of uh, we're praying. It's an opportunity for all of us to enter into the liturgy and, and actually experience the liturgy. And for a, a period of time, maybe people are um, allowing things to be so simple that they're mm -hmm. forgetting that we uh, want to experience God in many many different ways. Mm -hmm. And the liturgy allows for that. And using some new translations, new language, will help uh, move us into mm -hmm. a higher level, a greater level, a, a transcendent level of praying. It's been 29 years since we had a new translation of the liturgy. Yes. And why now? Now, I know in 2001, Liturgium Authenticum, Authentic Liturgy, that document was released where the Vatican was asking for a more uh, faithful translation to be made from the Latin. This would seem to certainly fill the bill. But why now? Why so long and why now? Well, I think there's a, actually a, 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 you, you have to go back and actually think about the fact that the Missal in multi, has been in multiple editions. When the very first Missal came out in 1474, it, it lasted for a couple hundred years, yeah. but then it was adjusted to fit the times hmm. uh, and to fit uh, the need of the church. And a few 30, 40 years later, it was adjusted again. And then maybe it, it lasted for a couple hundred years until Vatican yeah. II. Uh, if you look in a broader way of the movement of the church and the leadership of the Holy Father, Pope Benedict, mm -hmm. and this idea, understanding of the new evangelization that he's, he's promoting, yeah. as well as going back to John Paul, be not afraid. Open up your heart. Open yourself to the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. That this is a broader picture. And the Missal is a way of entering into that, into the church's life, liturgically, but in a, in a broader way, bringing more people to the understanding of God. I'm going to get into a few of these changes, and, and people are, I think, vaguely familiar with some of them, but I want you to explain what we're getting in these new translations. In other words, what the intention is and what it brings to the liturgy that perhaps we didn't have before or wasn't uh, highlighted in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I want to ask before we get into that, what is the integration of this new reform of the liturgy with the music we're hearing? Frankly, I was at a mass not long ago, not here, nowhere near this diocese, uh, on a, on near, near water, that's all I'll say. And uh, it was one of the most bizarre masses I've ever attended. The music was like 
an episode of American Idol. Are there any protocols in this new revision that will affect the music we're hearing and the way it's integrated in the mass? Well, right now you have, you have uh, some of the music that has been adjusted to fit the new words. Okay. okay? So you have the, these mass settings that are being used by some. Mm -hmm. and then there are also mass settings that have been uh, uh, written for the, the liturgy. But uh, speaking with some musicians recently, actually, they, mm -hmm. they, they believe that they haven't quite got to the point where the music will fit well with the, with the, uh, mm. with the missile and the words that are being mm. used. It's taking time and that uh, some want to see some new settings actually out, yeah. and there's, there's 80 of them or so out really? there already, and, but no one has quite found the ones that will become the popular Iconic. ones of, uh, of, yeah. uh, of the time yet. Mm. Well, yeah. we'll see. So we'll, we'll see wait and happens. see because we haven't started using it yet. What about postures, gestures, kneel, when, when, when we kneel, when we stand, will any of that change? Well, that's an important thing to, to remind people we are changing we are have new translations of the English mm -hmm. okay the the mass is not changing the structure mm -hmm. of the mass is remaining the same that we've come to know and love after Vatican II mm -hmm. that part is remaining the same the music will will be the same in a sense of the the opening hymn the closing hymns the things like that mm -hmm. that we hear for for communion the music that is set to the parts the people uh, uh, say or sing during mass for the for the major uh, proper parts, th those are being adjusted slightly because the words have have uh, been adjusted yeah. slightly. Let's get into some of these translations, and we'll put we'll put this up on the screen. Uh, the greeting, where the priest says, "The Lord be with you," and now people say, "And also with you." That will change. That will change to "And with your spirit." And with your spirit. And uh, there is a, a greater emphasis here that you're, we're entering into a religious moment here, that a uh, spiritual moment, and the reminder that um, the leader of this uh, of the liturgy uh, gathering together is the priest, but not specifically just the priest. We're talking about the office of priesthood. This idea of being ordained to 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 lead uh, the the community of faithful mm -hmm. uh, in prayer. This idea of that that the spirit has been given to them to help and to sustain them in that process. Mm -hmm. And so when we say, and with your spirit, we're saying something much more than just with you, who you yeah. are. We're saying uh, you, your office, you, you, who you are as priest, as leader, as shepherd of us mm -hmm. in this community. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to the penitential act. Um, this is the, I confess to almighty God and to you, my mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. Um, I've always felt uh, that this was lacking and, and in the Latin, it's there, and you could always read it in right. the old Saint Joseph. Culpa, is a mea maxima culpa, culpa. Culpa. Exactly. And it was simply struck from the translation originally. It wasn't there. The new translation reads, uh, in my thoughts and my words and what I, what I have done and in what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask the blessed Mary of a Virgin. What's the importance of that? The importance is a reminder of our contrition. Uh, that we're asking mm -hmm. God for forgiveness. As we're entering into this liturgy, we are mindful of the fact that this is the sacrifice that Christ has offered for us, mm -hmm. uh, for the forgiveness of sins for the world and for, for all, past, present, future, in mm -hmm. a sense. And, uh, and so uh, that is a, re a reminder that we have failed sometimes, that we're sinful people, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not uh, that we need to be afraid that we're, we're sinful, it's that we're, we recognize that we are and we can enter into the liturgy in a greater way by being mindful that that's all God asks is us to be aware of our sinfulness. We have an email here from Sharon and she writes, uh, can the Gloria still be sung with a refrain as is so often done in parishes? I'm hoping that the practice is no longer allowed, said Sharon. Uh, love the new translations and the deeper meaning that will uh, now hopefully bring people to a deeper understanding of the Mass. Yes, you'll probably still hear some of the uh, the glory refrains. The, okay, with the they're, so they're still allowed? They're still allowed, yes. Okay, and let's look at that translation. It changes a little bit. Uh, no, it's no longer glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth, but glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. Mm -hmm. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. It's straight from Scripture as the beginnings. Mm -hmm. It reminds us of uh, Christ's birth and the angels yeah. uh, proclaiming that to the, to the shepherds, um, as well as our address to, to God in offering who He is, identifying who He is to us. He's mm -hmm. our Lord, He's our God, He's our King, 
uh, and we say that and specify it in a, in a way that's beautiful, I yeah. think. Uh, we have another email here, Mike from South Bend. He writes that he's an organist. And with this revision, uh, the prayers and responses appear to sound extremely formal in speech. Why then isn't the music following suit? Why isn't that part of the revision? And do you foresee that coming? I think eventually we will get to, we will get to that uh, with some of the, the, the hymns and things that are offered. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for, for now, I think uh, there's quite a bit happening in a sense with getting up to speed with the new translations. Right. And so people are accepting of the of the uh, the older uh, mm -hmm. um, tunes that uh, they're more familiar yeah. with. And given Pope Benedict's focus and attention on music, I think we'll probably hear much more. Most likely, about that. most mm -hmm. likely. Let's uh, look at the Nicene Creed. It no longer reads at the beginning, "We believe in one God," but "I believe in one God." Mm -hmm. Why that emphasis? I know it was in the Latin originally. Well, it, the, it's in the Latin, exactly, credo. It's listed once. There's, right. That's an adjustment, actually, within the creed itself, uh -huh. uh, that there, we will now, where we had we believe, it will be I believe throughout. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the creed itself, the idea here is, is that we are mm -hmm. saying that as our personal belief in community with one another. Uh, versus uh, a belief of all together. Right. So that's the idea, that this is my personal faith. And then there's one little thing that I, I would take slight issue with. Um, I'll only do it on this show, not in Mass, where it says, uh, believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. invisible. Now, I don't have to change my tagline, do I? No, I don't think okay. so. No, okay, okay. No, I don't have to comply exactly, with ISIL, yeah, just exactly. the mass. Okay, yeah. um, but visible and invisible. Why visible and invisible as opposed to seen and unseen? Well, the idea that there's much more for all of us to see, mm -hmm. in a sense. There's much more that exists outside of uh, our ability to see than something. Than what we can perceive with our eyes. Exactly, mm -hmm. and the, the words here identify something in a greater way. It also, the idea of the new translations was to to use words uh, to allow t us to understand in a greater depth our faith and not uh, some sort of just general words that we would use in everyday settings. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, uh, th this next one is critical. It's also in the Nicene Creed. Um, uh, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, as opposed to the old one in being with the Father. Right. One in being was uh, thought to be closer to the, to the Greek uh, uh, setting mm -hmm. uh, words. Uh, and consubstantial, of course, is closer to the Latin consubstantialis. And therefore, the idea here is a, a very unique, unusual word, which was discussed and debated uh, for centuries, in a sense, if you think about it, identifying who Jesus is, his very connection to God, his nature, and the, uh, mm -hmm. how we, who he is uh, in that sense. And so it's important to use a unique word, I think, to describe someone who is unique. Yeah. There's another interesting uh, change here. This has been a bit controversial, where when the proclamation of Christ's sacrifice is offered for all, it's changed in the new Latin, uh, trans in the new translation, to for many. Correct. Yes, and that is, has this is causing the a lot. Words. Yes. Yeah. So that's what these. These are the words of institution when he right. elevates the chalice and the priest says, uh, at currently for for all, uh, or uh, pro uh, omnibus uh, versus uh, pro multis now, which uh, mm -hmm. for many. The idea there is actually uh, all was never really used. It's. Uh, uh, many is much closer to the scriptural uh, mm -hmm. understanding and the meaning behind that is uh, that Jesus did offer the sacrifice for all, okay? Mm -hmm. He did offer his sacrifice of his life for all. However, we have free will. We have an opportunity to accept that sacrifice, that gift of mm. uh, salvation that he has offered to us through that sacrifice. Yeah. And it recognizes that there are some who may not accept who that. Who reject it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that is who we are mm -hmm. as well. Mar Margaret writes, uh, is it easy to understand? Why is the church changing this? What was the matter with the old way? <laughs> well, there's uh, something broader taking place. This again, let me go back for a moment to yeah. this idea of the new evangelization. John mm -hmm. Paul promulgated the new missal, the third edition, back, way back in 2000 as part of the Jubilee year to bring more people to, to the love of Christ. And so uh, these new translations are going to help us, I think, really enter into the liturgy in a deeper way and not to be afraid of them, not to be afraid of the words uh, and to, to really, and not even be afraid of making mistakes when you're celebrating the Mass and mm -hmm. being a part of the, uh, the, the liturgy and going back to something that you might remember from 
from before. Yeah. To really enter into it uh, in a new way, in a beautiful way, and to uh, go deeper into what it means to celebrate mm -hmm. and be a part of the liturgy, the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, Archbishop Gomez in, in Los Angeles has written that this is a new Eucharistic, a moment and an opportunity for a new Eucharistic catechesis. Is that how you see this? And, and what are your hopes for this Religion. Very much so. Uh, one of the things I've experienced is I've gone around uh, the Archdiocese of Washington offering mm -hmm. these, uh, these workshops uh, is that once people enter into the workshop, listen to why the translations are being uh, mm -hmm. given to us and uh, why the, uh, the philosophy of translation has, has been adjusted, uh, they really find out that this mm -hmm. is an important aspect of who they are as a, as, a, as a Catholic and that it's a great opportunity for all of us to enter into the Mass, to re-examine the Mass and see what is taking place. This is an awesome event that takes place every day mm -hmm. for me as a priest and for, for many who go uh, to daily Mass. What a beautiful experience it is. And there's a lot, this is going that. to be a lot more difficult as far as a transition goes for priests than it is for the laity, yes? Because sure. the, the volume exactly. of yeah. changes are here. Here are the changes for people. Yep. A, few, a few cards. Uh, yep. a few, these are pew cards that people will yep. have in their pews, and, and they already have them there. Right. Many there priests are there. Many here are the changes sentences. for most of the priests. <laughs> oh, okay. I see. This, is, this looks like the old uh, budget, you know, the health care plan here. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, yes, there, there are a lot more for the priests uh, to, to deal with, but uh -huh. uh, we'll only take them uh, part by part, one week at a time, mm -hmm. uh, a few prayers uh, mm -hmm. at a time. And But when people start to listen to them, listen to them carefully, they're beautiful. They bring, uh, bring uh, to to an understanding of who God mm -hmm. is in a different way as we enter through the liturgical life, the liturgical oh. year uh, well, of the church. I, I, I always also think of the cultural memory. It's like Shakespeare. One mm -hmm. wouldn't dream of changing and pulling out those words and replacing them with something banal or less formal. Mm -hmm. In some cases, it elevates not only your ear and your soul and your heart and your mind, but it, it trains you in, and you become so familiar with that. It becomes right. part of our cultural memory. It has an impact. The Word itself, the, the Word of God should have the same weight. Why is it less worthy than William Shakespeare? You know, why shouldn't we, why should we be constantly uh, tweaking it and changing it and mangling it in the cultural mind? Well, the understanding is, is that the church is adapting to its times for its people to mm -hmm. allow, because we change too. Our language is a living language, it adjusts. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make sure that we, one, we are adapting to those, to mm -hmm. the changes of the people, but also mm -hmm. that the truth is always uh, given correctly. Very good. Uh, and so the language, uh, the adjustments are there because we don't want anyone to walk away from the Mass having the wrong understanding of what you, Very good. this is all about. Father Mark Nestow, thank you so much for being good to here. Be here. If you'd like to comment, uh, oh, I've got the wrong thing in my prompter. See, I just read and ramble on. Sorry about that. Uh, if you're visiting uh, or you'd like to more information on this new missile, visit the Archdiocese of Washington's website. They're at ADW. Dot org. And there's much information there. You click on prayer and worship and then click on new Roman missile. And it's all right there for you, a way to get familiar with what's coming. This uh, revision, third edition of the Roman Missal. It's an exciting time. Before we go, remember of the Ising, my comic cultural takedown with Laura Ingram's available at bookstores everywhere. Makes a great gift. And the Truth in Life audio Bible, which I produced, is available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. It's the only Catholic dramatized audio Bible in the marketplace. Stacy Keach, Michael York, John Reese Davies, Julia Ormond, and many others bring the Gospels to life as never before. Go to RaymondArroyo.com. You can click on the link to the catalog. It's right at the top of the page. And as long as you're visiting, check out the Facebook and Twitter pages. Uh, they are linked through on the left-hand side of the site. I post important news and commentary you won't find anywhere else throughout the week. And there's some great stories up there now. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Thanks for watching. I can't say visible and invisible. It wouldn't work. Talk to you later. Bye now. Thank you, Father. Great to see you. Thank you.